Hey there, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week, the 302 is a double feature. First, we're going to tell you about a very special program at Winter Tour that prepares museum professionals. And then we're going to tell you all about representing black womanhood. Get ready, the 302 is headed your way. wonder how all of the fantastic exhibits come together at Winter Tour and who puts them together? Well, in addition to some very talented professionals, Winter Tour also lends a hand in teaching the professionals of tomorrow. I'm joined now by Catherine Dan Rober to talk a little bit about the program that Winter Tour does in conjunction with the University of Delaware. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here with you today. So tell us a little bit about the program. What is it called? And what does it do? Well, the Winter Tour program in American material culture was really the first of its kind. It was founded in 1952 as a joint partnership between Winter Tour Museum that had just opened to the public the year before and the University of Delaware. And just as you said, it was intended to create a program that could could foster a professional staff for museums, which there really hadn't been professional training for that in the past. So it was to create the curators, to create people who worked as directors and education and all throughout the museum field. I can imagine that's probably a, a pretty large task because people don't really understand what goes into. It's not just finding a piece and, and putting it in some kind of order. There's a lot of research and you have to come up with a lot of themes and things like that. So a lot of um, you know, thought and preparation goes into, you know, creating beautiful exhibits like this. It really does. And that was the idea at the very beginning of this program that continues today, that in order to do that really well, to put on exhibits, to welcome people to museums, you have to have a background in history and art history in English and other, you know, sort of topics that we learn at school, but you also have to know what you're looking at in terms of the things that are in museums. So how to identify woods, how to look at a painting and see what paints it was made with and the brush strokes, to look at a ceramic and see the hands of the potter and understand what in the world, it's not just a vase, but is it a porcelain vase? Was it made in England out of stoneware or earthenware? All of those skills come together here in this program, which is a two-year program. It must be um, just an amazing program to go through because of just the wealth of items that um, the students have at their disposal to study and to learn from and how to categorize them. It really is amazing. So we use this collection as a lab in addition to those classes that are both held here and at the University of Delaware. And as a graduate of the program myself, I can tell you, you only begin to scratch the surface in those two years. But what we're really trying to do is to give the skill set and the toolkit to be able to do these things and to ask the right questions whenever people go off to whatever direction they pursue with their own careers, which is really varied in terms of what people want to do when they leave the program. Now you talked about it being a two-year program. It's a master program, yes, correct? Yes, it is. So I would imagine they'd have to have some kind of background in history or, or what kind of background do you actually need to, you know, to even apply? That's a great question. We just had the interview weekend for this program, so it does have a series of interviews. People come from a whole host of backgrounds. We have people who are far along in their careers working in the theater with costumes. We have people who are fresh out of undergraduate studying history or art history or anthropology. We have really people who have a host of skill sets what the common denominator is with them is that they really want to study objects and they want to interpret those stories to people in the world. So is the, um, the elimination or the selection process, I mean, I'm sure it's not like American Idol where you, you know, kind of like put them up on the stage and ask them about their history, but what, what kind of process do you go through in order to pick the perfect candidates? We've never compared it to American Idol. However, there are certainly actually people apply. We look at a first round of, you know, paper, um, 
you know, background in essays, but then we actually do invite them to have an opportunity to speak with us and to speak for themselves about what are their goals, where did they want to go, what did they want to do. And so it is a rigorous process, but it ends up with really wonderful people. And as you said, they're not everyone gets a place, but there's so many wonderful people who apply. And really, it's just a delight to be involved with that process and just to meet the candidates. Sure, sure. I would imagine it's probably an inspirational process as well. You know, not just for um, the candidates who are successful, but for the staff as well. You have a pretty strong mentoring program throughout this program, right? Yes. So it's a very small class each year with the, the, this graduate program. So there are eight students in each class for those two years. We have in-house um, staff and faculty like myself and my colleague, Tom Geiler. Um, we also have the folks at the university and everyone who works here at Winterthur. What we want to do is listen to the students. What do they want to do? Match them up with people who are going to closely mentor them, help give them skill sets like creating exhibitions to go forth with the strongest background possible to do whatever they want in terms of cultural heritage or whatever else they choose to do. Now you said that you never compared it to American Idol, but you do have a competition, I understand, a yearly competition. Can you talk to me about that? Oh, a competition, yes. So actually we usually do. So called the Montgomery uh, Connoisseurship Competition, where people choose an object of their own to make an argument about why it should be collected by whatever museum they choose. And usually this is a public presentation that we give and there is the uh, grand reward of $75. <laughs> that's pretty nice. It's like a steak dinner out somewhere. It is. Hey, a graduate school out of $75. That's like winning exactly. millions. Exactly. And when you're done with the program, the, your graduates go everywhere, right? They do. We have people who are working in so many different capacities in cultural heritage. That can mean curators at museums, educators, directors. We also have folks who work sort of outside of those normal boundaries, people who are leading with television um, in thinking about American craft, uh, people who work at places like the National Endowment for the Humanities wow. and who give fellowships. We even have folks who are working internationally as well. So maybe you should start thinking about an exhibit on your program. You know what? We actually had one a few years ago really? uh, on the uh, 25th anniversary, I think it was. Of, no, it would have been 50th anniversary of the program. Yeah. And it was really fantastic to celebrate that. But there's something to celebrate all the time. There's 16 people at any time in the culture program that we have here that are fantastic, wonderful individuals who each bring their strengths to the program. And we're so excited and honored to work with them. Yeah. Excellent. So we're going to talk to a couple of them in just a few moments. But if somebody's watching this and they're like, you know what, this would be the perfect thing for me to do. I would love to apply. How do they go about that? So you can look on our website. <laughs> it's the answer for everything these days. Um, but the University of Delaware is, as our partner, the place that sort of runs the application process. But I would also encourage people just to shoot us an email to ask about the program, see if it's a fit for you. Um, you know, I've talked to everyone from high schoolers to folks who've been uh, working for a number of years to see if this really is something that they want to pursue. If you love objects, if you love telling history stories, if you like uh, thinking about cultural heritage and the difference we can make through that, I think that this is a program that has a lot of opportunities. Excellent, Catherine. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you. It's been a delight. And we'll be right back. I'm Brent, and the Brandywine Zoo loves the 302. Welcome back. We're talking about a special program at Winter Tour that prepares museum professionals. And I have two of those students with me now. Um, on the far right is Kyla Temple and closest to me is Justice Bennett. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, let's talk a little bit about why you decided to, uh, to enter the program. Um, well, I've always loved museums. I grew up going to museums. Um, we'd happily wander in museums for hours, so I always knew that I wanted to work in museums. Um, and then in college, I gravitated towards art history and the study of objects. And I really love the interactions with objects and looking and touching. And Winniture seemed like the best fit given how immersive it is and that the whole collection is our lab. Sure, sure. And Justice, what about you? 
I was very different from Kyla. I, um, I'm one of those people who likes everything, so I just wanted to kind of try it all. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I got into Winneter. And what I like about Winneter is that it gives me the opportunity to figure it out as I go along. I can, like, let's say I really like that chair and I can just do a project on it without feeling like I was restricted. Which sure. Is nice. Sure, I can imagine that it's just such a great environment to learn in. Now, are you guys local? Are you are thinking about staying local? Are you wanting to go somewhere else? What do you want to do with this program? I ideally want to enter into a career in um, curatorial in museums. Um, my area of specialty is dress and textiles, so um, I'd love to work <laughs> with those in the future. But um, you know, I love all objects and. Um, just anything where I can work with objects every day would be ideal. Mm -hmm. I will go wherever the wind takes me. I, I have no real preference. I just, as long as I can work with cool things and with cool people, I am happy anywhere, honestly. Well, you guys are already working with cool people and doing cool things because Winter Tour gives you an opportunity to put together exhibits, one of which um, that you guys have been involved in is representing black womanhood. Now, Justice, I know that you were part of the selection process for the pieces. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yes, absolutely. So what inspired the, the show, The Representing Black Womanhood, is that I am biracial, I am half black, half white, and my mother was a black woman. So being raised by her and going to museums and feeling like I was not represented in museums, that there were not too many options for me to look at and be like, that looks like me, that looks like my mom. And I wanted to have a show that like really, one, celebrated black womanhood, but also really like confronted a lot of the racist depictions of black women that we see in museums. So with my initial selection process, I wanted to show, to have objects of empowered black women, but I also wanted the very racist depictions as well. I didn't want to hide these in the collections. I wanted an opportunity for people to look at them and be like, that really was not okay and we need to do better. Sure, and we're gonna dig down into some of those misrepresentations and the reasons behind them. Sometimes not always, it wasn't always a bad thing, but still needs to be light shone on it. Um, but Kyla, let's talk a little bit about COVID comes in, you know, Justice gets the ball rolling with the folks and puts the exhibits together. And then COVID just kind of blows everything out of the water. And you were part of taking it from um, the museum to the virtual world. Talk to me about that. Yeah, so um, everything shut down actually the week after we picked our paint colors for the gallery. So um, we pretty much went from our last class session being, you know, looking at swatches and seeing what complemented our objects the best to suddenly having to completely reformat and face the reality that the, there's a high likelihood this exhibition was never gonna be physically um, installed. So a huge part of that was finding the right digital platform. And we ended up using a program that we hadn't used at the museum before called Shorthand, which is um, a lot more popular in journalism for visual storytelling. And there was certainly a learning curve, um, realizing that you know the same people who put together exhibitions aren't always graphic design professionals either, but it was a hugely rewarding and great learning experience because I really feel that digital exhibitions are going to become way more important in museums and are probably going to become pretty standard even as companions to physical exhibitions. Um, so we managed to keep a lot of our text the same, but we actually got a lot more freedom for multimedia components with the digital format. You know, we could more seamlessly integrate video or interactives, especially for some of the objects that were books. We could find scans of those books that were available free online to link to so people could look through a book in a way that they might not necessarily be able to in a physical gallery. And I would also like to add the, the really good thing about having a digital exhibition is that it opens it up for more people to be able to look at it, especially since COVID disproportionately impacted women of color, black women in particular, it was really important, especially since this exhibit is about black women, for black women to be able to access this. So my mother, she her first interaction with Winneter was through this exhibition. This was the first time she saw herself represented in art in this way, and this was her first time experiencing the place that I worked. So it was really an honor to have this online so that my family back home could see it and they could see that I'm doing good things in, in an environment like this. So because of COVID, we had to get creative. 
you know, you created the, the virtual offerings online. So it's kind of like you're breaking ground while you're learning and it's amazing. It's an amazing opportunity, right? Yeah, it is. And you know, this is something that I feel is going to prepare everyone who works on this exhibition really well for entering their careers right now because um, we're both second years and being currently in the middle of the job, job search, um, what I'm seeing in a lot of job listings in my field is they want an increased level of digital engagement from the people working in museums. You know, it's not just about, we have a social media person who does social media anymore. You know, they want their curators and their collections professionals to be fluent in digital media and be comfortable putting together digital exhibits and reaching out to the public through more than a gallery. And there's only so much floor space, but there's lots of objects. So it gives you an opportunity to, maybe you can't see it here, but you can see it online, right? Yeah, and it definitely, um, at least for our exhibition being a student exhibition, we only had um, a certain budget and there were some objects, uh, contemporary art objects that we wanted to bring in that spoke to the historical objects that um, if we were in a physical format, we would not have been able to have the budget to bring those objects in physically as loans or purchases, but it was much more reasonable to get image permission or image rights to include them in the website. So we were able to incorporate more of those um, and in a more prominent way than we might have been able to in a gallery. Setting. All right, so when we come back, we're going to talk about representing black womanhood. Stay with us. I'm Bruce Lambrecht, and I'm president of the Delaware Aviation Hall of Fame, and I love to fly with the 302. Welcome back, we're at Winter Tour and we're talking about representing black womanhood. Now, uh, Justice, earlier we were talking about um, how these stereotypes and misrepresentations were made. Um, I wanna just jump into Uncle Tom's Cabin, a very uh, famous book written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was trying to end slavery, but it didn't really have the, the effect that she intended. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, what happened is that she created a lot of very harmful stereotypes, including the character of Turvey, the character of Uncle Tom himself. So that was really complicated because what do you do when you have these objects where in the time that they were created, a lot of, a lot of very well-intentioned abolitionist white people collected them, but then now looking back, they're very, very harmful and stereotypical. So what we wanted to do with our collection and like with the show is to have these objects on display, one, contextualize them and be like, this is what happened, but actually looking back at it, these were very harmful and we cannot keep doing this well-intentioned activism that actively negatively impacts the black woman, like, people. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about doing that? I mean, to, to, to show people who come to the museum, you know, what African American women, what black women were like then versus how they were portrayed. Yes, so that is really complicated. So a lot of the objects, um, I'm thinking specifically of this Topsy Turvy doll that we have. When we look at the, the depiction of the black site, so what it is, it's a doll. On one side it is a white doll and on the other side it is a black doll. And from a modern eye, you look at the black doll and you go, that is pretty racist. That looks like a very stereotypic depiction of a black girl. But I know that my grandmother, she used to play with objects just like that when she was younger because that was the only, that was the only time she had a doll or an object that looked like her. So we need to not only favor the white perspective at this time because black people have been too and black people engage with these objects in completely different ways than white people did. And a lot of these black people were like had these objects because they understood that it was racist but they also were like this is the only way that we're depicted. So you want to be able to have the exhibit be able to discuss all of these really complicated ideas of there's a racial component, there's a time component, and we need to make sure that we're not just over generalizing what these objects mean because then we're still silencing black women in the past. And in our planning for the exhibit, we thought it was really important to balance those um, more outdated, overtly racist depictions of black women with objects um, and documents that really showed black women in their own words and in their own conceptions of self. So we had um, documents from black women, cookbooks written by and for black women, a cookbook for um, the Hampton Institute, which is a historically black college um, that started training women and um, 
in this cookbook was for like a, basically a home economics course and sort of reframing that labor of cooking and housekeeping as something you know for your own advancement and satisfaction rather than in a service capacity. Sure. Now we're we're standing in front of a painting here, and this is part of the exhibit. Can you guys uh, tell us what this is all about? Yeah. So this is um, a painting by. Um, John Lewis Crimmel, it's called The Quilting Frolic. Um, it is one of the most requested images in the Winneter collection. So it's a very popular um, painting and object here, but we hadn't really interrogated some of the imagery in it until this exhibition. Um, so, you know, you can see this figure of the young black girl carrying the tray of cups in the center and then um, the figure of the black fiddler. And those are, you know, two very loaded um, depictions of black Americans e during this time period and, you know, in images that continue to resonate in a kind of negative way. Um, so we sort of place this image in the context of its time period and the other imagery um, surrounding and we had this really great counterpoint of um, this really compelling watercolor from Crimmel's sketchbooks which we do have in the Downs collection here in the Winneter library which I think is a very like real human and tender portrayal of an individual. I, I feel that from this watercolor you can really get a sense of the individuality of the sitter um, in her gaze and you know it was just sort of that contrast of you know, the different representations swirling around at this time and sort of maybe, you know, even reframing this artist's own work. So what do you hope when people come and they look at this exhibit, what do you hope the takeaway is? You know, um, an enlightened uh, perspective? Uh, Justice, what do you think? For me personally, it's to look at these I always center the black woman perspective. That's always what I want. And I want black women to be able to see museums taking accountability for a lot of their collections and be like, yeah, they, these were objects that were created and that we collected. And I also want it to be an opportunity for black women to then see amazing contemporary black artists who are doing amazing things. And I really just want that. I want them to understand that things were really bad and there are necessary steps that need to be taken to rectify this, but also there are really amazing works out there made by black women for black women. Now, I know that we talked about just a few of the items. There are so many in this collection, in this exhibit, and I really encourage everyone to come out and check them out and really see, you know, the way you guys have represented um, Black Womanhood. Thank you so much for joining us and good luck in your careers. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. For more information, you can go to wintertour.org. That'll do it for this episode of The 302. We leave you now with more shots of the exhibition. Until next time, tell them you saw it on The 302.